Well, there obviously the Contras were somewhat of a mixed bag. Uh, there were certainly people like you're describing. There was one guy named who went by the code name Suicida, and he went on rampages uh, in northern Nicaragua from bases in Honduras, and he did exactly that. They would slaughter um, a number of civilians. They'd rape women. They would uh, they didn't they'd execute uh, people who were professionals who might be were have some kind of government job with with the with the with the central government. They'd line them up and shoot them. They torture people. This was a pretty bad operation in, in many ways. Much of the reality was seeping back to Washington, despite efforts by the Reagan administration to keep it under wraps. So Congress got increasingly concerned that the U.S. government was backing this kind of activity, and and the Congress stepped in in the early part of the 1980s, uh, going through the middle of the 1980s, and said, first of all, this has to be contained, and then later they cut off the funding altogether. The so-called Boland Amendment. And what we saw was important then because it really was, it now it has been replayed in the present sense that President Reagan and, and Vice President George H.W. Bush, uh, as well as CIA Director William Casey, did not want to accept what the law said. So they simply took it all underground. Uh, much as we've seen President George W. Bush do when he's facing legal restrictions these days where he's under there are some for their laws saying you can't be involved in torture you can't be involved in 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 some of the uh, violent activities that that have been going on in the last uh, several years um, basically that the key has been always sort of put those under wraps keep the American people blinded to these realities uh, so they can be sold more effectively to the public and to Congress and, and the precursor to what we've seen today was Iran-Contra. And Iran-Contra ultimately was the, the Reagan administration decided it was going to continue to arm the Contras, regardless of what the law said. And they decided to violate other laws relating to Iran. Uh, they wanted to ship missiles to the Iranian mullahs as part of another scheme they were engaged in. And that violated the Arms Export Control Act, which was in which the government, the administration has to notify Congress of these kinds of shipments. And two, uh, it violated the, the rules against terrorism since the Iranian government was on the terrorism list at the time. So instead of trying to justify what seemed like a rather crazy scheme, the Reagan administration simply lied about it. And they, can, they did it sub rosa and kept the Congress completely in the dark until it ultimately got exposed uh, by a magazine article in uh, Beirut in uh, November of uh, 86. A month earlier, even though we'd been writing about Oliver North's activities at the AP, and there are a few other stories here and there, those stories were mostly not taken very seriously until one of North's planes was shot down in Nicaragua in October of 86. The Hassan and, first plane, right? Right. It was the one, and there was a guy who survived the plane, it was, the plane was shot down by some – there was a Sandinista draftee, a teenager, who had a – they gave him a, a, one of the, a Russian-made SAM missile, serviced air missile, and he fired it at the plane, and he was amazed that it went in the right direction. And, in fact, it hit the plane, and, and Hassenfuss, who was about to kick uh, a load of guns out for the Contras, was near the door. The door was open, and he was able, with his parachute, to, to get out the door and was able to parachute to safety. Everyone else on the plane, there were several other people on, on board, they died. But uh, Hasebus was captured and began pretty much immediately saying that uh, he was working not only for the CIA, but for the vice president's office, vice, the vice, vice president George H.W. Bush. Oh, now, but wait a minute, because uh, I've heard a million times that poor H.W. Bush was just out of the loop in the Reagan administration in the vice <laughs> president's office over there, Bob. Well, I think in many ways, George H.W. Bush was kind of Reagan's Cheney, if you will. I mean, he was very much the guy that Reagan used to carry out many of these uh, foreign policy functions and adventures. Remember, George H.W. Bush had been director of central intelligence in uh, 1976. So he was equipped in these areas knew, and knew many of the key players to, to work with. And, in fact, one of his, his national security advisor was a guy named Donald Gregg, who was um, – First of all, not only a career CIA guy, but he was also the person who recruited Walter Raymond from the CIA to come over to the White House to begin to perform this propaganda function. Uh -huh. What we saw was almost a test run uh, and for what, we've, what we're actually experiencing these days. Right. And the fact that they got away with so much of it 
yes, we did catch them a bit. Yes, they did. Some people actually were convicted. Uh, of course, President Bush, before he left office, pardoned half a dozen of them. Including um, Elliot and, Abrams, who's on the National Security Council right now. Right. But the point was that uh, since they mostly got away with it, uh, they didn't really, the American public never got a full sense of what had happened or why it was such a problem. And the Democrats played their, their role that they've gotten very accustomed to, which is to you know, not want to have too much hard feeling and, and, and not want to really dig too hard. And can they just sort of get past this and move on? That was sort of what happened then. And as we've seen, it's, it's recurring. The same pattern keeps recurring. The, the Republicans uh, behave very aggressively from the executive branch. They do do what they want. They, they sort of use propaganda. They, they deceive the American people. They, uh, they push the limits. And the, the Democratic role has often been to um, maybe make a few mild protests uh, and then essentially cave in. Mm -hmm. I think it may have been the last time we spoke, we talked about the uh, Seymour Hersh article where they had this meeting celebrating uh, some anniversary or another, I guess, of Iran-Contra and discussing the lessons learned. And they were cut out the CIA, cut out as many people as you possibly can, run the whole thing out of the vice president's office because, you know, there's so few statutes that control his behavior, that kind of thing. Right. I mean, obviously, they've even developed this new theory that the – uh, that the vice president is not part of the executive branch, and he's because he's not part of the legislative branch either. Uh, there was there was a line in the in a hearing last week when uh, David Addington, uh, who was uh, Cheney's counsel, now he's uh, the chief of staff. Addington was asked uh, about this theory that the that the vice president doesn't really fall under either section since he is uh, he does preside over the Senate technically. And one of the congressmen asked if what the uh, if, if the suggestion was that the vice presidency was kind of a barnacle on the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Addington, what branch are we in? Uh, sir, perhaps the best that can be said is that the vice president belongs neither to the executive nor to the legislative branch, but is attached by the Constitution to the latter. To the Close latter. quote. Uh, that's from two legal opinions issued by the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice, <clears throat> dated March 9th, 1961, and April, I believe it's 18th, 1961, by, uh, I believe, Mr. Katzenbach, if I remember. So he's a member of the legislative branch? To Vice President Johnson, and I offer those as exhibits so is 13 he, and 14. Mr. Addington, is he a member, well, then, you're saying, of the legislative branch? Without objection, they'll be entered into the record. Is he, so he's a member of the legislative branch? No, I said attached by the Constitution to the latter. He is not a member of the legislative branch because the Constitution says that the Congress consists of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The con Constitution further says that the Senate consists of senators, and the House of Representatives consists of representatives, and he is neither a senator nor a But he's attached to the legislative branch? That's the quote I read you. So he's kind of a barnacle. You know, he is attached. It, the kind of word, word was attached by the Constitution to the latter. I don't consider the Constitution a barnacle, Mr. Cohen. No, the vice president, since he's really not fish nor fowl, he just attached to something. It's not, the, the, it's not exclusive in the Constitution to have that situation. The, the time of the gentleman has Thank expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Um, in the... Uh, with this group, what they've been very good at is uh, finding sort of semantical arguments and tying people up with them. What is torture? And they sort of play various word games with torture. You know, what is, what are the laws? And they're not that they're very good arguments. And we've certainly seen recently where when, when these things reach even something like the, the appeals court, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington just the other day dismissed one of the designations of a uh, of, a, of a Chinese Muslim who had been at Guantanamo for six years. They dismissed the, the allegation that he was an enemy combatant. Uh, and the, the judges, including two Republican judges, uh, in their opinion, they said they compared the arguments that the Bush administration was making to uh, Lewis Carroll and one of the characters in one of his poems that, uh, who said, if I repeat something three times, it's true. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what they were doing. They were simply repeating something that had no basis in fact, but the Bush administration kept repeating it. So the argument was, well, if we, if we have it in enough government reports and give it to you, then you must believe it. So, so when these things reach even people who are relatively conservative and somewhat really sympathetic to the Bush administration, 